Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. It is my joy to welcome you to worship this morning on the second Sunday in the season of Easter. Our celebrations continue. We began our time together this morning with pictures of water as found in creation all around us. We give thanks to God for the gift of those waters, and we give thanks to God for the gift of our baptismal waters that claim us as God's children. Let us take a few moments as we begin this time together to give thanks for the gift of holy baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life, in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning as we give thanks for the waters of baptism is We Know That Christ Is Raised, number 449. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the source of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. This morning's reading is from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning at the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. 
When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand, and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did this many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, I want you to think back to your high school history class. More specifically, I want you to think back to Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark, who in 1803 set out with a band of brave explorers to find a water route from one side of the North American continent to the other. What followed was 15 months of hard labor and a seemingly endless string of back-breaking days. But finally, the corpse of discovery led by Lewis and Clark arrived at what they believed to be the end of their journey. They carried their packs and their supplies and their canoes up the mountain, believing that it would guide them to the end of the earth. For over 300 years, Explorers had been looking for this same water route, and everyone just knew that it had to be out there somewhere. For Lewis Clark and their team, they were convinced that they were on the precipice of greatness. After 15 months of going upstream, they relished the idea of finally letting the current swiftly whisk them off to the Pacific Ocean crest the final hill, find the stream, and coast their way to the glory of the finish line. But as that eager group of explorers finally crested the peak of the mountain, they couldn't believe their eyes. For instead of a gentle slope leading to the Pacific Ocean, what they actually found awaiting them on the other side was the seemingly endless an unforgiving expanse of the great and mighty Rocky Mountains. In that moment, everything changed. For what laid before them was nothing like what was behind them. Suddenly there were no maps, no experts, no best practices. They were officially in uncharted territory. And what became quickly evident was that the true adventure, the, the real discovery, was just beginning. I wanted to share that story with you this morning because, and in a number of ways, I believe that it shed some light on John's Gospel and on the story of Thomas. I sometimes like to imagine Thomas standing on the top of his own mountain looking as Lewis and Clark looked out upon a landscape that was simply unrecognizable. After Jesus' death, nothing was familiar anymore. The road seemed lost amidst the treacherous landscape. The horizon looked terrifying. What lay before him looked nothing like what was behind him. If there was ever a moment to experience a crisis of faith, to doubt, this was certainly it. Thomas had officially entered uncharted territory. But Jesus wasn't done with Thomas yet. 
For in the midst of his fear and surrounded by his concern and under the weight of his doubt, the risen Savior revealed to Thomas the nail holes that still marked his hands and the hole from the spear in his side that still gaped open. Faith was born out of our Lord's woundedness. Did you hear that? Jesus restored Thomas' faith with scarred hands and a wounded side. Jesus didn't reveal his glory through dazzling light or, or blazing power or a perfectly restored body, not this time. Jesus didn't transform or transfigure or hide the truth of what he had gone through, no. In, in fact, quite the opposite. Jesus opened his scarred hands. He presented his wounded self, and in so doing, Thomas was inspired to proclaim one of the greatest testimonies in all of history. My Lord and my God. Because of those scars, and because of that wound, Thomas was able to step faithfully into the uncharted territory that stretched out in front of him. You know, as I listen to the news and as I read the headlines like each of you, as I pay attention to my own wonderings, I can't help but to believe that we as a church and as followers of the risen Lord, I can't help but to believe that we have also entered uncharted territory. The world that lies ahead of God's church looks very different than the road upon which people of faith have walked before us different even than the road upon which we ourselves plodded along only a few weeks ago. And like Lewis and Clark and like Thomas, it would be easy for us to retreat in fear of the, of the vast unknown. It would be easy for us to doubt our ability to share the good news and the gospel in such surprisingly unfamiliar times. But to us, Jesus also says, See my hands. Touch my side. Do not doubt, but believe. For just as Jesus' scarred hands and wounded side were able to guide Thomas through the rough waters of his uncertainty, so also is Christ determined to inspire our faith. A faith let us never forget that we are called and commissioned and sent forth to share with the world so deeply in need of the hope of the resurrection. Our trembling hands are still able to serve. Our feeble voices are still able to proclaim. Our, our weary feet are still able to journey. Our failing ears are still able to listen. Our squinting eyes are still able to witness. Our wounded hearts are still able to love. And our scarred lives are still capable of rejoicing. The wounded, though living Christ, means that we are free to step boldly into the days ahead, forever confident that no matter how unpredictable the times, and no matter how uncharted the territory, God will always be there to walk with us. Jesus' wounded hands and pierced side ought to remind us that this is a divine moment. For if we pause long enough to listen, we just might hear our God calling us to live as a band of eager explorers, willing to head into uncharted territory with a mission that is worthy of our utmost dedication. Because maybe, just maybe, the true adventure, the real discovery of our time, is just beginning. May we be given faith enough to guide us into the days ahead. Thanks be to God. Amen.
uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join God's people of all times and all places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Let us pray. Open the doors that we close, O God, when we fear those who worship you in different ways. Guide us to unity and harmony so that we may come to respect and cherish our commonalities. Hear us, O God. Open the paths that we ignore, O God, when we prioritize financial gain and convenience over listening to the groaning of the earth. Inspire all to care for the world that you have made so that living things might thrive. Hear us, O God. Open the rooms we lock, O God, to those who live without a homeland or place of safety. We pray that generous nations may offer refuge and peace for all. Hear us, O God. Open the hearts that we close, O God, to the cries of those who are in pain. We pray for those isolated physically or emotionally, especially at this time. Today we carry in prayer all of those whose names are on our prayer lists and whose needs we carry in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Open the ways of love, O God, in the pursuit of peace throughout the world and bless the efforts of those who share your good news. Hear us, O God. We pray for our bishops, Michael and Susan, their assistants and Pastor Kimber Ardeen, for the joy we experience in our shared ministry. Hear us, O God. Open the way to eternal life, O God, as we remember those who have died in faith. Free us from the fear of death, that we may embrace the peace that you have promised. Hear us, O God. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal and loving care, asking all of this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. <laughs> Now, dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Jesus is alive. Go and peace.